Hello, hello, hello. I'm Meryl Khalili. We are DM25, a radical political movement for Europe. And today we're looking at the situation in the Middle East and the information war that's running in parallel with it. My guest is Lucas Fabraro, who's also my colleague at DM25. He's our communications director, and he's been on the front lines of this information war. And hopefully we're going to be exploring this issue to understand a lot more about what are the dynamics out there? What could be different this time compared to other times that Israel-Palestine has exploded in the past? And uh, let's dig into it. Lucas. Hey, Amara. Thanks. Tell me something. I mean, I want to be kicking off like this. Why do you think it's important what's happening online? For people that are that are watching who are like, well, who cares what, what's said on Twitter or Facebook? There are people dying out there. Why, why is it critical to the outcome of this conflict. What's important about it? I think it's saying that what happens on social media doesn't matter is on the same level as saying that what happens on TV or on newspapers don't matter. So if you if you put it that way, it, it, it doesn't take very long to see the insanity of, of what it means to say that what happens on social media doesn't matter. So many people, billions of people, obviously are active on social media. Everybody knows that. I think what some people often don't realize, so is that for a lot of people, that's pretty much their only contact with politics, with political information. They don't read newspapers. They don't consume, you know, mainstream media really very much in general. Obviously, they don't trust politicians. They don't, they don't particularly care what they say or don't say. And also, and on a personal capacity, uh, I think very often they just don't talk about politics, even in person with uh, family or, or, or friends, all that often. So really, social media is the only way in, especially for younger people. So I think it, it's a it's a grave, terrible mistake that few people make these days, but some still do, to disregard social media and or a particular social media vehicle, because you know, sometimes the animosity is not towards social media in general, but it's it's towards the latest social media thing. You know, like Twitter is fine, you know, it's respectable, it's academic. But TikTok is for kids, you know, it's for little dances and, and trends. It, it's not for serious uh, political conversations. People say the same about Twitter. <laughs> when when Twitter came along, it seemed like a ridiculous idea to sort yeah. of reduce um, discourse to that length, you know, of characters. I think it was 140 at, at first. I'm looking at a stat here, which says that about 25% of US adults under 30 now regularly get their news from TikTok, from Pew Research. If you listen to this for the first time and you're not active on TikTok, that might sound terrifying to you because of the idea that people have about TikTok in, in their minds. But it really isn't. Like I spend a lot of time on TikTok. I've seen content, journalistic content made by amateurs, basically. They're also by professional journalists, but by and large by amateurs that are, you know, sometimes teenagers. And they're much more well-informed than, dare I say, mainstream journalists themselves, especially in, in issues such as Israel-Palestine. So I think it's not only, am I, in general, I'm not, don't have the same concerns that most people might have about this, but not only that, I welcome it because think about Israel-Palestine, for example, and I live in Germany, right? So I have a very heightened perception of what's going on. Everybody does, but in Germany in particular, I think it's really scary what the general climate is on mainstream politics and mainstream media. Where would we be in Germany right now if it wasn't for social media? I have no idea. You know, if basically the mainstream media that lies through their, their teeth and basically just copies and pastes Israel press releases as, as news without verifying anything, if they had a, a stranglehold on what information makes it to people, basically, which would be the case without social media. So I welcome it. Of course, there are concerns about social media. We're not going to get in, in, into them, uh, you know, of the the, the monopolistic control that is, these corporations have. However, I think without social media right now, we'd be in a much, much worse place. That's without even starting to talk about how it empowers people on the ground in Gaza themselves mm -hmm. to send those images that we consume on a daily basis right now. That's, you know, 99% of them you know, CNN would never in a million years run them. What's been happening in the last, this has been eight weeks now, something like eight weeks since this has been going on now, the bombardment of Gaza. There's been a lot of protests every weekend, 
and during the week across the world. I was listening to an interview with the with the Palestinian ambassador to the UK last night. And he, what he was arguing was that if it hadn't been for so many people coming out of the streets, Israel would have wiped Gaza off the map by now. So I wanted to get a sense from you about what role you think social media plays in actually mobilizing people and getting them out onto the streets for this cause. I think that the, the last thing that I said before you, you asked that question is, is the key to understanding this here. The images coming from Gaza, from the people being massacred right now, not, not the news channels that you know are covering it from not even inside Gaza. I mean, what that Western journalist is still even inside of Gaza. But you know, from from Tel Aviv, like imagine that what was sort of how how their reporting is colored in in a situation like this. So I think, you know, I, I will leave the, the the deep analysis for people smarter than me on 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 these matters. But in in my view, this has been really maybe the key. You know, the the images that you see on social media, they are appalling. They're enraging. There's really no other term that you can use. And when people are enraged. You know, that's the most powerful emotion, I think, that can drive you to the streets to protest, to actually mobilize even people who have never done that before in their in their lives. And I'm convinced that dozens, if not hundreds of thousands of people have participated in protests for the first time in their lives in, in places like Europe, thanks to this crisis. And I think, by and large, they have been mobilized by what they saw and consumed on social media. I mean, as a counterpoint to that, look at... The war in Ukraine, which started in February 2022 and was also a kind of modern modern war of the social media age, let's say. And there we also saw a lot of very, very brutal images on both sides. And yet the, the, the reaction here seems to be different. In the last eight weeks, the atmosphere is, is much more electric, much more nimble, much more responsive. And these images, as you've as you've said, these awful images to see are kind of getting getting into people's minds and hearts a, a lot more than perhaps the, the the ones that have been emerging from Ukraine since February 2022. I mean, tell me, what's your read on that? Well, I think there there are a few key differences, right? The, the, the first one is just the just to get that out of the way is is the just the geopolitical difference. And in the case of Ukraine and Russia, you know, Russia launched an illegal war. And no matter what you think about our share of responsibility in the lead up to it, of which we have plenty as Western countries, but the invasion itself was a criminal act, of course. Uh, you're not you're not supposed to do that in international law. And they committed, you know, countless war crimes since they they, they launched the, the invasion. But at the end of the day, it's still a conflict between two countries. You know, it's a conventional war, so to speak, in that in that sense. And that's all we have in Gaza, of course. Gaza is not a state, it's an occupied territory. And and so the level of the, the, the asymmetry of it, I think, has no comparison to the Ukraine-Russia case. I think the other key difference, it's not, I don't think it's so much, of course, the, the, the how horrifying the images themselves are, I think, play a part. Naturally, we've seen horrific images coming out of Ukraine as well, just, you know, massacres and the innocent civilians being targeted and all that. I think still the level of dehumanization that the Israeli government has for Palestinians and as a result, the acts that they are willing to perpetrate on Palestinians are almost unmatched in any other place in the world. So there's that. Again, the asymmetry of it as well. But I also I think a key difference is no one was cheering on Vladimir Putin in the West when, when Russia invaded Ukraine. We didn't arm Russia to, to do this invasion. We didn't continue to arm Russia after the invasion happened. Politicians were pretty much, you know, without exception in the West, condemning the, the, the Russian invasion, expressing almost unlimited solidarity with Ukraine, arming Ukraine in order to, to, to resist this, this invasion and, and fight back. And the mainstream media was doing the same thing, you know. I mean, in a lot of countries in the West, you can be walking down the street and you see Ukrainian flags hanging from government buildings. Do you see a Palestinian flag anywhere when you when you walk around London, like from a from a public institution, or you know Germany? Not speak of Germany or anything like that. So that's also the key difference, and we must not forget 
our governments and our mainstream media are cheering this on. They're cheering on this, this, this massacre and this, this genocide. So I think that combined with the images that you see from said genocide, that just doubles the, the rage that people feel, you know, and, and, uh, and it compels them a lot more to go to the streets and to mobilize because there is actually something that uh, is happening that must be stopped, which is the, the, the support from politicians and from our media to the Israeli government, which is not the case in, in, in Russia, obviously. Well, would you say that this is really a split between the people and the elites in the West when it comes to opinion on this war? Yes, absolutely. Take Germany, for example. Germany looking at it from the outside and even from the inside for, I think, most people, it seems that the vast majority of the population has this unwavering commitment to the Israeli government and whatever it does. If you look at polls, that's absolutely not the case. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is that the, the people in power are in unison, just rabid supporters of the Israeli government and all of its criminal policies. And so they create this political climate in which it becomes taboo, even though these people, you know, might be the, the majority, or at the very least, it's certainly the, the, the other people, the, the people who support Israel and critically are not the, the majority, it, it makes them afraid to speak out. It's, just, it's really as simple as that. Uh, so it, it's, it's this, this climate of uh, making a certain position taboo and silencing, silencing people uh, that way. So in, in, in that sense, there's a very clear split, of course, between the 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 people in power, the politicians and the mainstream institutions, and uh, the people at large. I'd like to dig into the information war part of it a little bit more. A couple of weeks ago, we had a live stream and I asked you a question about whether you thought Israel was losing the information war. And you said yes. And I'd like to explore a little bit now about why you think that's the case and, and what may be different this time compared to other times when Israel-Palestine has exploded, as it, as it has sadly happened so often. I mean, let me just set it up. I always thought Israel was a master of information warfare. I can remember in 20, I think it was 2009, there was this tool that was, I hope I'm not misremembering it, but a tool called, I think it was called Megaphone. And you would sign up to it, and this was this was put out by the Israeli government or, or a group that was close to the Israeli government with their sanction. You signed up to it, and whenever there was anything anywhere that was negative about Israel, any blog post or new media article, something like that, you would get a little alert in your tray and a, a, a message that you could copy and paste so that you could go to that website the blog that had the the offensive thing against Israel or the or the, the the combat against Israel and write your own comment. So I mean this was before like bot army and all of that, but but I, I just I looked at it and I thought, wow, that is next level stuff, really. I mean they really raised the bar for what 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 smart information warfare can be if you can if you can look at it like that. I mean tactically it made a lot of sense. Well, ethically, perhaps not. So I want to understand what you think has gone wrong this time and how perhaps the Israeli state and its supporters have been caught unawares and, and what are the dynamics that are creating essentially an enormous amount of pushback for Israel that, that you think is, is, is causing them to lose this information war. What's different? Well, I think the, the key difference the the wheels have come off on the propaganda. It's gotten bad, like real bad, <laughs> like comically comedy sketch level bad. I I think that's that's a key difference here. So the the question then is how have we gotten here, right? That this country that you mentioned that used to be so good at propaganda that you had to come up with a term just for the particular type of brand of, of propaganda, a country that had a PR operation that was so good, so state of the arts that. You know, the state itself, is, is, itself uh, in large part, owes its, its existence to the, the, competence, the competency of this beautiful PR propaganda that was done from, you know, from the, the 1920s, 1930s on. So what happened? I don't know. Um, however, uh, I, I was reading something recently, on, I think just on Twitter, like a, a Twitter thread, I can't remember who, who wrote it, but sort of analyzing it. 
And their argument was that basically they got lazy, much like the IDF on a, on a military level got complacent. And so we got you know, caught unawares uh, by this Hamas uh, attack and, and, and took a very long time to sort of to even, uh, you know, get them out of the territory and, and get them back to Gaza. Much like that happened in military terms, I think in, in propaganda terms, it was the same thing. They got complacent. And so the, uh, this, you know, devious sort of misinformation that Israel is so well known for, for having mastered has become this sort of cartoonish, very teach a type of, of propaganda. You know, like you see, the, to see the, uh, an army spokesperson point to a calendar with the names of the week in, in Arabic and saying that the, their names of terrorists. I mean, I, I, I have, I, I've tried to visualize what chain of events led to this happening, you know, like what was said before they hit record for them to, to just think that that would be, that would be okay. And you just can't. And I think, look, Israeli propaganda is directed towards the West, right? 99% of it. So I think that the fact that they've gotten so lazy is an indictment on us because if this is meant for the West to consume, and there, it's so blatant how fabricated it is. That means that it, the Israeli government thinks we're all a bunch of idiots. And you would think that mainstream politicians and media would take offense with that at some point. The problem is a lot of these mainstream politicians and mainstream journalists, well, they're idiots, to, to, put, it, to, to put it clearly. So, uh, so they don't take offense. They continue to copy and paste it as, as if it was, uh, you know, just uh, standard uh, news that was, uh, that was verified in proper journalism. So th- I think we should understand that as well. That uh, it's an indictment on our leaders, on, on the people in power in the West, that uh, Israeli propaganda has gotten so cartoonishly bad. And I think it's also a sign of the political climate inside of Israel and how so, so far right, right, it has lurches. It was always, you know, much more to the right than, than your regular country. But right now it's just, it's just so far to the right that there's not no other really brand of, real brand of propaganda that would even fit, you know? So that, that's kind of like, it's the only thing that you could hope to have coming out of a, a government that has people in power like, like Israel has. Well, that was what I was going to say, because the fact that it's a far-right government now, the most far-right government in Israel's history, the whole thing becomes more like an ideological crusade for them rather than a political and a strategic question. So maybe that's why they've kind of taken their foot off the gas. They believe that they're so firmly in the right that they don't really need to try. And perhaps that's why the, 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 the propaganda competence is, is falling behind. But I'd like to put a bit of flesh on this. Can you give me some examples? You, you, you mentioned now this calendar. I mean, tell us about the Al-Shifa hospital case and why that backfired on Israel. Well, I think it's, it's, it's hard to say for sure, but I think that, uh, you know, even, even Western media has its, has its limits sometimes. Like you saw that, for example, when the, when the Jabalia refugee camp was bombed for the first time, I think it's bombed, it's been bombed, bombed multiple times since then. But for the first time, we, and it killed hundreds of, of civilians. There was this now infamous clip on a, of an Israeli uh, spokesperson going on uh, CNN and, and talking to Wolf Blitzer. Wolf Blitzer, you know, a seasoned uh, s- supporter of, uh, of, of Israel. And even he was shocked at the sort of how, at, at the uh, nonchalant tone of the, the spokesperson, just basically saying, like, yeah, that's a tragedy of war. You know, there was, there was the Hamas commander there. So we, we just bombed it away, period. And he was just giving him every opportunity to just sort of walk back from the statement and, and, and saying something that would uh, cover the backs a little bit better, uh, and he just wouldn't take it. So I think even Western media sometimes, fortunately, has its limits. Not all Western media, though, unfortunately, because this case that you mentioned with the al Hospital, yes, the BBC uh, questioned Israeli uh, claims, as did many Western news outlets. However, the, the biggest newspaper in, in Germany, Zeit, simply copied and pasted the Israeli press release that they found a Hamas command center underneath the hospital. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't happen uh, everywhere. You know, I think we notice when it backfires just because, you know, it's, it's always good to see that uh, this sort of wall of Israeli propaganda that's reproduced by Western media can be breached sometimes. But let us not forget that there are still plenty of very, very high profile news outlets out there 
that are still just taking every single bait. What do you think of the data points that might suggest that Israel is losing the information war? I mean, you've mentioned a couple of specific instances and people like Wolf Blitzer, who I believe was involved with APAC. I mean, this is no regular CNN anchor, even him exclaiming, you know, exclaiming horror when faced with a, with a rather amateurish IDF spokesperson about what Israel had done. So why do you get that sense? And maybe we can also shift to looking at, at TikTok as well, where I believe there are a lot more people that are pushing the Palestinian position than the Israel one. I think one of the main data points that people took notice of, and I can't remember the exact numbers now, but it was looking at hashtags on TikTok and their popularity. So pro-Palestine hashtags, such as you know, Free Palestine, compared to pro-Israel hashtags, I think Stand With Us being the, the, the main one, if I'm not mistaken. So they look at the popularity of them and the, where they ranked. And, and I think the, the pro-Palestine ones were something like 80% more popular than the, 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 the Israeli ones, essentially, the pro-Israel ones. And I think that just basically proves what a cursory glance at a platform like TikTok. Of course, you have to be aware that if you were, for example, pro-Palestine, you consume a lot of pro-Palestine content like I do, then you put into this, this bubble where the algorithm only feeds you similar content. But again, we have hard data that uh, says that uh, actually this is, this is taking place. We also have information that the Israeli government is panicking about this. <laughs> and uh, institutions that do Israel, the Israeli government's bidding, like the Anti-Defamation League in the, in, in the US. Is that their name? The Anti-Defamation League? Yeah. yeah. The ADL. Yes. They're panicking about it. There was a, there was a leak from a, an internal meeting that I saw the other day on, on Twitter of their president or, or whatever. Just basically, uh, you know, losing his mind over <laughs> how badly they were losing the, the information war on TikTok, saying that they have a very, very, you know, big problem with uh, younger people. So they're panicking about it. Uh, you know, the Israeli lobby is talking directly to TikTok. There was this very amusing headline, I think, from Vice recently, where it essentially went, the, the TikTok uh, CEO says, we're not doing anything. Young people just don't like you to the Israeli government. And you know that that's you you can see that. I just wanted to mention something that's also related to TikTok, but not you know to go on a on a, on a slight tangent here, but just because I think I, I know that you're gonna love this. In in a lot of the contents that I started noticing that in the content that I post about Israel Palestine, the pro Palestine content, of course, a lot of people will, will comment. You know, they'll comment on the content of the video, but a lot of people will just comment to to boost the the post and to you know make it more you know, bring, get the engagement up so that the, the algorithm feeds it to, to other people. And then I started noticing recently that I post, I would post like a video and then I would start seeing comments like, oh, lovely hotel. Thanks for the tip. Oh, or, oh, that's a great hair routine. What, what, I, I can't find this product though. Would this be a good replacement? And I was like, what the hell is going on? And then it turns out that people, because TikTok itself, you know, is, is no, you know, you know, as you, as you can imagine, uh, they don't they don't necessarily want to push for Palestinian content either, especially as uh, they're facing the threat of uh, being banned in the U.S. And some people are getting shadow banned or just outright banned for posting pro-Palestine content. So TikTok, you know, is not covering itself in, in, in glory. It's the people using TikTok that we should be praising. And so to 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 try to dodge that, people started uh, posting comments on pro-Palestine uh, pro videos as if they were commenting on a, a travel blog. Uh, video in to try to avoid any keywords that TikTok might might have been, might have flagged in order to shadow ban videos. Not only words that were said in the video itself, but also in the comments. You know, because if you see a lot of pro, you know free Palestines in the in the comments, maybe the video is going to be docked because of that. So people are just commenting just like random travel blog stuff to 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 help push the video with the algorithms. So on one hand, TikTok is facing accusations that it's promoting pro-Palestinian content. And the head of the ADL is freaking out about the uh, what he perceives as an imbalance. And on the other, they're shadow banning people who post pro-Palestinian content. How does that work? Well, the TikTok is not, I don't think even the Israeli government or the, the ADL or any of these people, they, they seriously think that TikTok has an agenda here to 
actively push pro-Palestine content. They say it because they 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 know that that's going to play in the media, you know, and that it's going to help put pressure on TikTok uh-huh, to do exactly what TikTok does often, which is to 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 actually censor pro-Palestine pro-Palestine content. I've had videos that were taken down in my personal account, although in those cases they were reported by people trolls essentially that are trying to to silence the, the these videos that went viral. And then I appealed and then uh, TikTok restored them. But I've heard countless people say that they either had their accounts banned or shadow banned. You know, you you, you post a, a video about Palestine and it gets exactly zero views, uh, which is almost impossible on a platform like TikTok, unless the algorithm is actively uh, trying to silence you, essentially. Mm-hmm. Okay. I want to ask about anti-Semitism. And the accusation of anti-Semitism as a, as a cover for political disagreement. I mean, we live in a strange time, you know, especially in the last five or six years. Very strong social justice movement, and we've seen accusations of bigotry used to shut down debate in all kinds of areas. It doesn't mean there isn't real bigotry out there. And I'm certainly not trying to minimize the the very real consequences of anti-Semitism. And yet, the sense I'm getting is that I mean, when I go on my on my timeline, for example, it doesn't take long for disagreement to spiral into well, you're just being anti-Semitic by claiming that Israel was doing this, etc. And then that's the end of the discussion. That's it's, it's shut down. My sense is though that this accusation, when used as a as a political weapon, is losing its teeth. Tell me what your what your sense is on that. Obviously, the, the these accusations of this blanket accusations of anti-Semitism when you criticize the state of Israel and its government have been weaponized for a very long time. As, as a matter of fact, it was part of this brilliant PR operation that we were talking about that has been at the core of, of Israel policy for since since its uh, inception, uh, essentially, and before that with the Zionist movement. I think it's, well, the, the, j- just the, the, the scale and, and, and the nonchalant way in which Israel deals with its crimes and the evidence, the hard evidence that we have of those crimes have been part of this decoupling of the, the anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism in people's minds. Because I think people who even used to equate these things are now not so pro, not, not 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 that pro-Israel anymore because they're 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 seeing the evidence that this is a government that is is criminal it it oppresses and massacres people. But I think also the just the 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 levels of sheer absurdity that the people who weaponize this term have uh, taken it to like for, for instance the, the the cases here in berlin of uh, jewish people being arrested for uh, taking place in uh, pro-palestine protests the the case of this organization the 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 jewish voice for for, for uh, just peace in the, in the middle east that they hosted this uh, event at a cultural center here in berlin called oyun i was there it was a beautiful event we talked about peace we saw jewish people stand side by side with muslim arab palestinian people talking about true lasting peace, refusing to live in hatred and in suspicion of one another. It was beautiful. It was, in other words, exactly what we need in times like these. What is the, the rewards that this organization and the, the cultural center that uh, hosted it gets from the, the, the city's government? They want to close the cultural center, basically, by cutting the public funding that they're committed to providing until the end of 2025, by the way. They just cut it. So... You see the, the you know who 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 can see the absurdity of a case such as uh, as this? The, the city government is trying to tell a Jewish organization that they are not allowed to to host an event for their anniversary, and and if they do, they're going to shut down the cultural center that uh, that, that that hosted them. It, the case of of Edith Fetz as well, which was a member of a Jewish Voice, who was one of these people who were arrested uh, at protests. One in, in one case, it was a, a lone protest in which you just held up a sign saying, as an Israeli Jew, stop the genocide in, uh, in Gaza. So when you start seeing cases like, like these, then y- y- you really like they're, they're doing your work for you, basically, in, in trying to expose the absurdity of um, weaponizing this, this term, which is, is, a, is a travesty and a disservice to Jewish people 
first and foremost, because anti-Semitism, of course, is is real, is a real thing, is a real problem. It's especially pervasive in the far right in Europe, the same far right that is now praised for taking part in pro-Israel marches, such as Marine Le Pen, after spending decades spreading just despicable anti-Semitism. But, you know, that's how it goes in, uh, in in Europe these days. If you just, you know, pledge your allegiance to the to the state of Israel and its government and its policies, then all is forgiven. Something else I wanted to ask you, uh, just to take another path here a little bit, is about Twitter. Now, Musk, Elon Musk bought Twitter, God, I can't even remember now. It was like a year and a half ago or two years ago. October 2022, I think. October 2023. 22. 22, yeah. So, sorry, so... so so one year ago, before Bus bought Twitter, the U.S. intelligence and security agencies, the U.S. political establishment, were very close to Twitter. And a lot of evidence has come out since then, which has convinced me that they were able to get content either outright censored or shadow banned or played down in order to manipulate and, and put their thumb on the scale a little bit of, of public discourse, which had a very profound effect on issues back then, it was issues around COVID and vaccines, and, and then later the, the war in Ukraine, etc. So do you think that there's a case to be made that since Musk bought Twitter, Musk a self-proclaimed free speech absolutist for all his faults, and we have many uh, disagreements with Musk, do you think that there's a case to be made that that a lot of this, the kinds of images we've been seeing, a lot of the kind of debate that we've been commenting on in this call now wouldn't have come out under the old Twitter regime. No, to be honest, because these these things are still getting out on places like Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. These images are, are still all over, which of course is not to say that they're not repressing them in a lot of cases. They are doing that. They're banning accounts. They're shadow banning content. But they're still they're still out there to a, a pretty staggering extent. I I think sometimes I, I will see an image on a place like Instagram, like a video of the aftermath of an Israeli airstrike or something like that, and I am shocked first and foremost at the images naturally, but I'm also shocked that I'm seeing this on Instagram. How did they allow this this content? Sometimes it doesn't it doesn't even have like a graphic content warning. This is not an invitation to start banning this content if anyone from Instagram is, is is watching this. I think it's great that you can that they can see it there. But you know, this is Instagram. This is Meta. This is Mark Zuckerberg. This is someone else that has, is a very close ties with the, the, the political establishment in the in the U.S. and that has proven very willing to censor content uh, in the past, just as uh, the old regime with uh, Twitter was. So, you know, you never know, but I think it's, I, I don't have the feeling that things would be all that different had Musk not bought Twitter. As a matter of fact, uh, just to, to mention as well, Musk was meeting with the Israeli president uh, yesterday and saying despicable things about, about Gaza and the, and the war. So I don't have any particular trust in this person when it comes to this conflict and moderating content on it. That's true. And I, I think he said that because he got into a bit of hot water for a tweet he made, which could be construed as anti-Semitic a couple of weeks earlier. So he's kind of all over the shop with that. App. But let me push back on that a little bit, though, because on, on one hand, yes, this information is on in Instagram and Facebook and so on. But on the other, the political elites and journalists, opinion makers, they are on Twitter. So th they might not necessarily be going to Instagram and Facebook to to look for for that content. And, and also, I recall that back in the day, Zuckerberg and other platforms as well were meeting with the US security establishment and, and Biden's team and, and, and so on to, to suppress or, or censor content. Maybe the only reason they're not doing it now and that you can see images without graphic warnings of the type you describe is because they know that the public, are, you know, they've got, they might have Twitter in one window and and Instagram and the other, and be like, "What the hell? This is like two different worlds." And they and they're kind of forced to to show that stuff. I don't know. So I'm not sure that they we can say that like it's exactly the same situation, despite the fact that Musk bought, bought Twitter. But I don't know. Tell me. I mean, you're saying I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that there would be zero difference. I'm just saying that you wouldn't. It wouldn't particularly. I don't think it would be a game changing difference. I, I guess what I'm trying to say, because yes, and Musk, in some respects, he has 
been less strict with his policing of content than the old regime of Twitter was, which by the way, I have nothing, no good things to say about. And, and the, the, the type of collusion that they had with, you know, US intelligence uh, agencies and all that. I'm just saying that I don't, I don't really see the, the difference being that significant, I guess what I'm trying to say. As far as mainstream journalists are concerned as well, I don't, they, they, they get the information, the, the Western ones, they get the information mostly straight, straight from the, from the Israeli government. I think, you know, they're, they're, they're not, they're on Twitter, especially in a place like Germany, they're on Twitter to see who is not towing the line and to then bring their power fully onto those, uh, those people to try to silence them and, and shut them down, like artists, uh, people like that. But they're not that to try to get any news that they're going to seriously r- report on. We take it. Okay, so as we come to a close on this, I'd like to look forward and see where do you see things going now in terms of these social media dynamics, in terms of how they're impacting statements from from leaders and actually the, the political discussion in those circles where decisions are made that could really impact things on the ground. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to try to make any predictions because, you know, it the, usually fail when you try to do those with, as it, when it comes to Israel-Palestine. However, you do get a sense that this this is a, we're never going to go back to how the the world was in relation to this situation before October this year. I think things are going to be permanently changed, and I, my hope and my sense as well is that they will be changed in the sense that a pro-Palestine sentiment for a resolution that would bring freedom in Palestine to all people, for Israeli Jewish people, for, for Palestinians, everyone who lives in Palestine, essentially, and, and, and whose homeland is Palestine. My hope is that we'll, it, this, this whole situation, despite of and because of the tragedy that uh, triggered it, will bring us closer to this, to this solution. I also think that it's important for people never to underestimate the power of Western public opinion on this, on this issue, especially in the U.S., but also very much in, in Europe. The minute we get a critical mass in public opinion in, in our countries, in Western countries, I think it's game over for the Israeli government's apartheid. It's game over for their occupation. Um, it's game over for this 75-year-long, even longer injustice that we see going on in Palestine. We need to make them pariahs as they deservedly should be. And I think the only way we do that is by influencing public opinion in the West, because it's the West that backs the perpetuation of, of the system of oppression in, in Palestine. So do not underestimate the power of posting, essentially, you know, post, post away, post all the time, post about Palestine, post in defense of the Palestinian people, post about the climate of repression that is uh, going on in your countries. If you try to say something that was pro-Palestine in class and school and, and you got silence, post about it, you know, do that. It really does make a difference in, in if not right now, in the long term. And non, don't stop there naturally, you know, mobilize, go out on the streets, try to influence things in other ways as well. But I think that in keeping with the theme of our discussion here, do not discount the power of social media. Well said. Well, thank you very much for that, Lucas. Lucas from Barre, very interesting conversation. And yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks.